Good evening, everyone. I am Giancarlo Guerrero, Music Director of the National Symphony. First and foremost, I wish that all of you and hope that you're all at home safe and healthy with your families. This has been a very interesting time, but here we are trying to bring great music, not only to our wonderful Nashville Symphony patrons, but around the world through the wonders of social media. By the way, as I am giving this lecture, please feel free to write any questions or comments that you may have. And at the end of the lecture, I will gladly answer as many as I can uh, to continue the discussion. This week would have been a very special one for me because I would have conducted the last numbered symphony of Gustav Mahler. Until now, I've only done the nine symphonies of Mahler, including, by the way, his Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth, which I did a couple of years ago. But the 10th symphony, I had only conducted the first movement. I will talk a little bit more about that in a, in, in a few minutes. When Mahler died in 1911, he left us a trilogy, two works that were completed and one that was left in sketches mostly. The Song of the Year and the Ninth Symphony would be premiered within a year of Gustav Mahler's death. But the 10th Symphony would not have that same level of luck. And actually it sat in a, on a shelf for many, many years and even decades for several reasons, mostly because Mahler's music was not quite as accepted in the early part of the 20th century. And also because there were a lot of misinformation about it, of which I have to admit, I suffered from. I really did not, not know much about this work other than the fact that the piece was left unfinished. All that I knew is that the first movement was truly completed by Mahler, but the rest of it was just mostly sketches. How many sketches? That I never really cared to find out. To me, it all ended with the Ninth Symphony and maybe this one movement from the Tenth Symphony. It is very interesting because I adore Mahler and I have done pretty much all of his music, but this symphony never really caught my attention until about eight or nine years ago, uh, the Sao Paulo State Symphony Orchestra in Brazil asked me if I would consider doing the first movement of the 10th symphony, which I agreed to, uh, but I wasn't really all that excited about it. And the reason that they asked me is because they knew my love and affection for Mahler's music, but I accepted almost as a uh, curiosity thing. It was not something that really captivated me, but sure, I get the chance to conduct the 10th Symphony first movement. I'll do it. And as I said before, based on my own knowledge of the piece, I knew that it was the first movement was the one movement that Mahler had actually completed. So I went to Brazil. I prepared for it. The concert all went great. The orchestra was fabulous as usual. But honestly, by the end of the week, I never didn't feel a sense of reward. I didn't feel like I had achieved much. I mean, the piece is kind of interesting, but it felt it was very much incomplete. So for me, that would have been the end of it. And I said, you know what? I conducted the first movement. I will dedicate my life to the other nine symphonies plus the Song of the Earth. And of course, the orchestral songs that he wrote as well. Fast forward a few years later, and I was on a very, very long flight going to Australia, which takes a long time. And after watching too many movies, I basically had run out of stuff to do on the plane. So I actually took out my own uh, uh, computer and I actually had there a recording of the Derek Cook version of the 10th Symphony. I also knew by the way that Derek Cook's version, which was the one we were going to play this week, was probably the most performed and the most famous, but, but was not the only one. I knew that there were others by Rima Massetti and Clinton Carpenter, and I even owned recordings of those, but as I said, they never really truly captivated me. So on this long flight, I guess I had nothing better to do but to sit down and listen to the whole symphony of Gustav Mahler, the 10th symphony. I have to be honest with you, maybe it was being at 40,000 feet up in the air that something happened. There must have been a spark that as I was listening to the music, I started asking myself and saying, but hang on a second, this sounds like Mahler. I mean, this whole music, I mean, I know it's unfinished, but I don't even know who this guy Derek Cook is, but wow, he did a fantastic job. It sounds like Mahler. And I guess that must have sparked my curiosity to research further and really find out beyond the first movement, what else did Gustav Mahler leave? I mean, did he leave enough information? He loved breadcrumbs for musicologists or composers later in the day to find out? Well, that's where it has led me to this week. After my research, I came to realize that this is truly Gustav Mahler. And all that Derek Cook did and some of the other musicologists was really kind of fill in the blank. 
But what we do know from those sketches is that beyond the first movement, Mahler left us an entire arch of a five movement piece, a five movement symphony in two parts, which was common with Gustav Mahler, by the way. Some of his symphonies were too long that he always separated them into separate parts. And he liked doing that. The fifth symphony, the third symphony, and now in this case, the 10th symphony has part one and part two. The other thing we came to find out was the fact that he actually finished the whole symphony when what we call short score, which is basically piano forehand scoring. A lot of composers do this by basically writing the melody, writing the accompaniment, sometimes some of the counterpoint, perhaps some indications of orchestration to later fully orchestrate for the whole orchestra. But this is the way that composers usually start. As I came to read and research more, I found out that Mahler, not only did he have the idea of the whole symphony, he even gave titles to some of these movements as well. So it's not that he just kind of died all of a sudden like Mozart did in his famous Requiem, which we all know was left unfinished. Those were truly unfinished sketches. In the case of, of, of Mozart, it was actually kind of a, a student of his, uh, Franz Xavier Zuzmeier, who was basically tasked by uh, Mozart's widow Constanza to finish the work because she, was, she needed the money. And even in the hands of a somewhat mediocre composer, Mozart's music still comes through. In the case of Mahler though, Mahler left us, as I said before, enough information for somebody else to take it over. By the way, Derek Cook was not by far the only, the only person that tried to tackle this. We do know that other composers uh, were reached out, I mean, and were approached to see if they wanted to do it. Among them, Arnold Schoenberg, Dmitry Shostakovich, and Benjamin Britten. And all three of them basically rejected for a very simple and very uh, logical reason. They all felt that if they tackled it, at the end, they all had such powerful personal musical languages that at some point, the music was not going to sound like Mahler. It was going to sound like Britten or Shostakovich or Schoenberg. So they turned it down. And again, the piece just sat on the shelf. Another reason was that Alma Mahler, Gustav Mahler's widow, was very much against the idea of finalizing and finishing these sketches. Uh, she herself was a force of nature, and actually she went on to outlive her husband for more than 50 years. Mahler died in 1911, and Alma died in 1964. And this was a woman that was attracted by powerful men. Before Mahler, she was engaged to the great composer Alexander von Sandinsky. In, in the middle of Mahler's marriage towards the end, especially after the tragedy of the death of their five-year-old daughter, she started a, an affair with Walter Gropius, the famous architect. When Mahler died, she started another relationship with Oskar Kokoschka, the great writer. Then eventually she went to Gropius, married, uh, had a daughter, and then she went, divorced and married Franz Berfel, the great writer. So she herself was kind of her own personality. So in many cases, she almost at times prevented from people from doing this until 1960, which was the year of Mahler's centennial, of his birth. The BBC in London had commissioned Derek Cook to basically look at the sketches and see if he could maybe make a version of a couple of the movements just as an exercise, because I mean, it was a very, very important year. And Derek Cook being a musicologist said, you know what, I'm not a composer. All I have to do is maybe fill in the blanks So that is what he did. And Alma Mahler found out about it. And actually she was totally against the idea of finishing this. She felt that that should not be touched, that Mahler would have wanted this never to go out into public. But then through a friend of a friend, they actually brought the broadcast from the BBC of that 1960 centennial celebration. And they wanted Alma to hear what the 10th symphony sounded like. And after she heard it, she changed her mind. And we actually have a letter that she sent out postmarking New York on, on May 8, 1963. Dear Mr. Cook, Mr. Harold Burns visited me here in New York. Today he read me your excellent articles on Mahler's 10th symphony and showed me your equally authoritative score. Afterwards, I expressed my desire to finally listen to the London BBC tape. I was so moved by this performance that I immediately asked Mr. Burns to play the work a second time. I then realized that the time had come when I must reconsider my previous decision not to permit the performance of this work. I have now decided once and for all to give you full permission to go ahead with performances in any part of the world. I enclosed a copy of my letter of even date to the BBC 
Sincerely yours, Alma Maria Mauer. So finally, Mr. Cook had full permission from the widow to finish the entire symphony. As I said before, even in the hands of a musicologist or an untrained professional composer, Mahler's language and Mahler's music comes through very, very clearly. And with the magic of uh, technology, we actually found a page on YouTube that has Mahler's actual manuscript. So as I play some of the examples, you will be able to follow along not only what Mahler wrote, but more importantly, what he did not write and perhaps take it upon yourself on how Mr. Cook filled in the blanks. The first movement starts, interestingly enough, with a large solo for the entire viola section. And the main theme then is played by the violins. It's quite captivating music. But remember, this is 1910 that he started writing this. He died in 1911. And you can clearly hear that he's already stretching tonality. We are already in the 20th century. Another big section of this first movement, which by the way, I remind you, was the one movement that he was actually completed. Well, about 90% of it. I mean, there were still sections that he still needed to finalize the orchestration, but pretty much it's all there. But there is something that I want you to listen to in the climax of this first movement. You're going to hear a very, very dissonant chord, something that sounds very modernistic, which gives you proof of where Mahler was going with his style. And a man that died before, you know, a couple of months before his 51st birthday, you've got to wonder what Mahler would have written had he lived another 20 years. What would have happened if we had another 15 symphonies of Gustav Mahler? Here, I think we get a snapshot of what Mahler's musical language was moving towards, and he was being heavily influenced by, by the artistic moves of the 20th century. Listen closely to the dissonance and Mahler's stretching tonality.
you do get the full Mahler effect with the climaxes, but the sonorities are quite shocking. I mean, even sitting here, standing here, it's sometimes hard to believe that this is actually Gustav Mahler writing this. Beyond the first movement, starting with the second, of course, is where we get into the territory of the sketches. And some of them, as I said, are in four parts, two parts. As we follow along in some of the examples, you will be able to see how much Mahler actually left. And in some cases, it's not only is a lot of information, not only in terms of harmonies and writing, but in some cases, some very, very clear uh, indications of what he intended, what instruments he intended to play, whether it was the oboe or the French horn for the violin. The second movement is a scherzo. But here you have to notice the mixed meter, especially because scherzos are just supposed to be very fast waltzes. This precedes Stravinsky's 1913 Rite of Spring by three years, which normalized the utilization of complicated rhythms in a lot of the music of the 20th century. Mahler was already ahead of his time, and I dare you to try to find the downbeat. It is always a moving target, which makes it one of the most difficult and treacherous music I have ever encountered. This is the perfect musical example of a minefield. without the score was trying to find it. It's like the worst Waldo of downbeats. But you know what? Let's do something. I'm going to attempt something that I shouldn't do, but you know what? It's just too irresistible because it is so challenging that also for a conductor, it's just too much fun to try to do, hopefully survive without having to step on any of the mines being laid by Mr. Mahler. You know what? Let's hear that again. But this time, <laughs> I will try to conduct this along. So you can see that the downbeat is nowhere where you think your instinct tells you it is. As a conductor, you have to literally fight your natural desire to conduct what the music sounds like, not how it is written.
and it goes on and on and on and on like that. As I said, almost every measure is a different meter. And it's supposed to be a sketch, though, and it still feels like a waltz. But as I said, it is very treacherous because the downbeat is not what you think it may be. But don't despair. Like most scherzos, this movement has a trio section that is in Lendler form, which is a common Austrian folk dance widely used by Mahler in some of his other compositions. This one is much more comfortable to conduct because it is in the expected meter of 3-4. That's more familiar territory, and I'm sure you had no problem finding where the downbeat was. I'm sure some of you were probably dancing to it. Such attractive pastoral music. The coda of this movement, the ending, brings back the complicated scherzo once again and wraps it up with the first movement opening theme of the violins, but this time in very heroic form played by the French horn. This, by the way, marks the end of part one of this symphony. After getting to know this music so intimately, there were a lot of things that, that I took for granted that I literally had to change my ideas that I had about Gustav Mahler. His Ninth Symphony is one of the works that I adore and cherish the most. It's a piece that, that is so conclusive. And I always was under the idea or the myth that Mahler was coming to his ending and the Ninth symphony was his way of saying goodbye to the world and anybody who is attracted to his music knows this story and that's why to me not exploring beyond the ninth symphony was never of interest because it was such a perfect ending the ninth symphony wrapped it all up beautifully Mahler becomes sick he knows he's dying and he gives us this final symphony where he says goodbye to the world but that's the 10. What do we do with this material that we're listening to tonight? And you know what? Listening to this scherzo, the way that this heroic theme comes back and, 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 and you hear it with such joy and optimism. This is not the work of a defeated man. This is not the work of a man that was ready to die. I, if anything, you hear the opposite. So in many ways, it's completely shattered my own beliefs that I had of Mahler's music and his own life. And the more I researched, the more I realized that Mahler became ill very quickly. He died in May of 1911. And the first signs of trouble were in December of 1910, where he developed a cough. And then he developed a consistent fever. And then it was a very, very quick decline. This whole idea of the Ninth Symphony, which was written almost two years before, and then the tenth of which he had been working on that summer, again, this is not the work of a defeated man who knew he was going to die. Everything happened very, very quickly, and in the end, it was an infection, which probably nowadays would have been easily cured. So, in many ways, 
getting to know the symphony made me revisit some of my own beliefs about Gustav Mahler and made me realize that this man had so much more to give and he was willing to give more. The third movement, he actually gave a title to in the folder where the manuscript is, he titled it Purgatorio. This is the beginning of part two of the symphony and the remaining movements are to be played without a break. The title of this movement is not really associated with the religious meaning. It is more closely inspired by Dante's epic, Dante's epic poem, Divine Comedy, which was one of Mahler's favorite books, by the way. The first part is Inferno, followed by Purgatorio, and finalizing in Paradiso, which, by the way, will make its appearance at the end of the symphony. Mahler fully orchestrated the first 30 bars of this movement, but the rest was left only in four-stage scoring. Listen closely to the main melody of fast 16th notes in the very opening of this movement. This will serve later as the main motif in the last movement. Beautiful, cute music. From here, we go to the fourth movement. And here, Mahler writes a second scherzo. But this one is one, this one has a more aggressive and hellish personality. The opening begins with the same dissonant, dissonant climatic chord from the first movement. This one imitates a lot of the same textures he utilized in the first movement of his Song of the Earth. By the way, in one of the manuscript pages, Mahler actually wrote the following line, the devil is dancing this with me. find it so remarkable and so interesting to be able to follow along with Mahler's manuscript and you see the basic lines but it's also fascinating to see how Mr. Cook like a detective trying to almost imagine and guess in some cases how Mahler would have finished it. In the last movement in the opening you will hear a tuba solo followed by the French horns bringing back the 16th note motif from the third movement. It opens with a solo thud played by the bass drum, clearly indicated by Mahler in his manuscript. Depending on which version you believe, there are a couple of ways of approaching how to play this particular note. Mahler only indicated to play it SF, which means sforzando. It's just really a fancy way of asking the percussionist to play it really loud. But the question remains, how loud, how aggressive? According to Alma Mahler, the use of the military drum stems from a funeral procession that Mahler once observed in the winter of 1907 while they were staying in New York. They saw the cortege of a deceased fire chief that passed below their hotel window. And from high up, the only sound that could be heard was the muffled stroke of a large bass drum. The introduction of the last movement reenacts this scene as a, as a rising line of the tuba slowly tries to make headway and is repeatedly negated by the loud drum strokes. 
However, some musicologists believe that such narrative was probably made up by Alma Mahler. You know, she was known to embellish certain anecdotes to place herself in the middle of Mahler's creative inspiration. If you believe her narrative, the drum should be played in a respectful yet loud and muffled manner, but without disturbing the solemnity of the funeral procession. This bass drum drum can also represent the shock that Mahler suffered when he found out about his wife's extramarital affair. This means that this note should be played as loud and as disruptive as possible. I'm gonna be honest with you, as of today, I still hadn't made up my mind of how I was going to approach this powerful moment. I was waiting to test different versions and even different bass drums at the rehearsals and decide which would feel more natural in our own performances. In this version you're going to listen to, the percussion fully goes for the shock. So I may suggest that you may want to lower your volume. Although, if you're brave enough, I think you will want to get the full effect if you decide to just stick with it and listen to it with its full volume. It is quite a surprising and powerful moment. Quite shocking, isn't it? I think there are good reasons to do it either way. But this one that you heard is quite powerful. I may, I'm gonna be curious in, at the end of this, in the comment section, what you may think about this, how you would have approached this if you were the one conducting or if you were the lucky enough to be the percussionist hitting this note. For me, this next musical example is the climax of the entire work. In a very explosive and intense way, he brings back the dissonant chord from the first movement, along with the 16th notes motif from the third movement, along with the opening theme of the viola, but this time with all of the French horns playing it in unison. The combination of all of these materials from different movements confirms to me that Mahler had conceived this entire work, even if he didn't live enough long enough to finish it.
For the ending of this symphony, Mahler brings us back at last to the opening key of F sharp major. The final page rises to the highest level of passionate affirmation. As all of the violins give out one last primal and painful scream. Mahler, by the way, indicated that scoring in the manuscript. But the movement gradually recedes into a great serenity of spirit, touched by resignation. But unlike the endings of the Song of the Earth and his Ninth Symphony, this music gives a sense of benediction. The troubled purgatorial material undergoes one last blissful transformation. And at the very end, the falling five note motif swells out and dies away again like a great sigh of contentment at finding peace at last. The finale has risen out of the inferno, back through Purgatorio and into Paradiso. Over the final bars, you will see in the manuscript that Mahler wrote, for you I live, for you I As well, in the bottom, he writes, Almshi, with exclamation point, which was his pet name for Alma. This is a final vow of undying devotion to his wife. It would seem that in the end, he found salvation from bitterness and despair through the strength of human love. So there you have it. This would have been a fantastic week, but I'm absolutely certain that we will get over this crisis and we will all be together once again. And we will bring this Mahler symphony to completion and to performance in our fabulous Kemmerhorn Symphony Center. I wish that all of you remain healthy and safe in your homes. And I look forward to that first day when we all get back and celebrate beautiful music together. So let's now continue the conversation online. I look forward to reading some of your questions and uh, continuing to uh, enjoy and appreciate the wonderful world of Gustav Mahler. Good night.